So first of all, it is a great honor for me to be here and thank you for providing me the opportunity to talk. Uh, so my name is Akenta Kyuchi from the Computational Relativistic Astrophysics Depart, uh, Division in AI in Potsdam. <laughs> and today I'm going to talk about our uh, recent progress of our uh, latest understanding of the compact time simulation. In particular, I'm going to focus on the new maker modeling of gravitational wave sources in March Messenger Astronomical uh, Ally. <clears throat> so please uh, do ask any question during the talk. <clears throat> Here is a list of my the collaborators. The first one is uh, Professor Masaru Shibata, our director in, in our division. And senior world manager and show Fujibayashi from our group. And M. Pinzo was a postdoc in our, in our group, but he recently he moved, moved on to the Wuhan University as a faculty position. And Kotaro Kyutoku from Kyoto University, and Kyohei Kaochi from ICRR in the University of Tokyo, and Yuchiro Sakiguchi Toho Universities. And you may know that Kenta Hotogezaka, he was in the, the, the Pinzo University as a Spitzer Fellow uh, a couple of years ago. And Masami Tanaka from Tohoku Universities, and uh, uh, Kunishito Yuka, Amitani Hamid, and Watao Nishizaki from uh, YATP. Uh, from YATP. <clears throat> so, this is a talk plan, uh, today's talk plan. So, first, uh, I want to, uh, I'm going to give you the brief introduction of gravitational wave astronomy and gravitational wave astrophysics. Um, in particular, I'm trying to convince you why a new mega relativity simulation is necessary. So, <clears throat> in the second part, I'm going to talk about the new maker modeling of GW 190521. The LIGO and uh, Bargo uh, reported the detection of gravitational waves in this event, and they, uh, Lisa, uh, they <clears throat> reported that this event was caused by the binary black hole mergers. But recently, we proposed an alternative model for this GW 190. 521, and specifically, we consider that the black hole surrounded the massive total system. So I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to explain that this uh, model could be a alternative model for this GW event, and we're going to discuss the what is a necessary ingredient to distinguish the, the two scenarios. In the third part, I'm going to talk about the new maker, our latest new maker modeling of black hole neutron star mergers. <sighs> Uh, by chance, the paper is out today on, on the ICAL. On the ICAL. Uh, in particular, um, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to focus on the central engine of short memory first, uh, in this case. <clears throat> and finally, I'm going to summarize the talk and I'm going to mention the prospect. Okay, let's start from the gravitational wave uh, event in this diagram. <coughs> It's, oh, sorry. Okay, this is uh, uh, the gravitational wave uh, event uh, provided by LIGO and our uh, collaboration. Uh, this is a GW uh, TC2. By the way, the GW TC3 uh, appeared yesterday. So at least yesterday, maybe the, uh, this uh, figure is already a bit old. But anyway, since 2015, uh, the gravitational wave astronomy develops. <laughs> you can see that uh, this is a compact binary merger event observed so far. You can see that the bunch of the binary black hole mergers and uh, the solar masses, uh, sorry, source masses uh, expand, uh, is, is a range from the six, from six to the hundred, something like that, which means that the binary black hole mergers has diversities. <clears throat> LIGO and Barger, Bago uh, observed the binary, two binary neutron star mergers so far. One is, of course, the golden event, GW 70.17, and the other one is a GW 19.04.25, and whose mass is significantly greater than the, uh, the mass observed in binary parser, which means a uh, binary neutron star merger have diversity as well. <coughs> the LIGO and the uh, Bago Kagura Corporation reported uh, the detection of the black uh, hole neutron star binary two events. <coughs> two events, yes. <coughs> so, in they blow a bunch of these uh, observation blow a bunch of things to us. For example, uh, before the detection of the binary black hole merger, 
we didn't know this system really exists in the in the universe, but now it, it exists. So that's a, yeah, some people extensively discuss about the formation channel of this binary black hole system or validity of the general relativity in strong gravitational field uh, regime or and so on. For the binary neutron star mergers, we know this exists, but this is the first time to see the merge, emerging moment of binary neutron star mergers. <coughs> And this event brought a bunch of things to us as well. For example, this uh, observation uh, gave a stringent constraint on the equation of state of the nuclear matter. And we confirmed that the binary neutron star merger is a nuclear synthesis site of the heavy elements. <laughs> this links to the so called rapid neutron capture process or R process and the uh, kilonova macronova, uh, which was observed in this event. And we confirm, we also confirm that the binary neutron star uh, drives a short gun reverse. This is a smoking gun of the so called uh, the merger hypothesis. And the measurement of the Hubble constant uh, implies, uh, suggests, uh, imply that the uh, opening of the gravitational wave cosmologies. <clears throat> so for black hole neutron star merger, we didn't know this system exists before the de detection, but uh, we know now we know it exists. <clears throat> So there are a bunch of things to do. <clears throat> so we also confirm the importance of the electromagnetic counterpart for this event. Needless to say, this is a very famous timeline for the GW 70 So in this event, uh, the gamma ray, UV optical, IR, X-ray, and radio bands are observed, not simultaneously, but observed. <clears throat> so recently, the excess in the x-ray uh, at 3.5 years after the merger were recorded. So the people, including ourselves, uh, discussed uh, what's the origin of this excess. <clears throat> so in such an exciting era, so I'm going to uh, introduce about the role of the numerical relativity. <clears throat> so first, I want to ask, uh, I'd like to ask that uh, is uh, whether the uh, numerical reality is really necessary or not? The answer is, of course, yes. Because without the gravitational waveform modeling, the equation of state of nuclear, star, nuclear matter cannot be constrained. <coughs> numerical relativity is a unique tool to explore the late, state of, late stage of the in spiral dynamics or just uh, before the merger, merger phase. Because in, in this situation is a highly dynamic, dynamic and highly nonlinear, so any perturbation analytic frameworks will break down. The numerical relativity is a unique to to explore such a such a phase. <clears throat> the numerical relativity are also important for the to to explore the physical mechanism of the electromagnetic counterpart. For example, the my big collaborator Kenta Hotogezaka did a great job for the mass ejection of neutron rich matter from the binary neutron star mergers, which is connected to the, uh, the kilonova or macronova emission. <clears throat> but uh, still, the systematic is, is very large, so we need a more sophisticated simulation to, uh, to suppress the systematics. <clears throat> So uh, I wouldn't say that general relativity is the final or unique theory of gravity. So <clears throat> some people try to extend the numerical relativity to the theory beyond the whole GL, uh, although this is not my expertise. But ultimately, I want to answer this question raised above, raised above quantitatively, but it is still far, still far. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, the numerical relativity is, uh, is trying to figure out uh, phenomena associated with uh, compact objects such as uh, neutron stars or black hole. The ultimate goal of the new, uh, numerical relativity to build a physical model of the uh, physical model modeling <coughs> in which all the basic interac interactions are implemented simultaneously or self consistent way. Spe uh, uh, specifically speaking, uh, the general relativistic gravity is evolved by solving the Einstein equations and the uh, equation of motion relativistic fluid and the neutron radiation transfer, uh, neutron radiation field, and the electromagnetic field as uh, evolved by the uh, conservation law and uh, 
Boltzmann equations and maximum uh, equations, uh, respectively. <clears throat> this is a recipe for uh, numerical relativity because uh, Einstein equation is split into the constraint equations and evolution equations. Uh, giving the linear, uh, realistic in, initial condition mean that you solve you, you have to solve the constraint equations. The blue part is the main loop part. We solve the Einstein equations, matter equations, uh, neutral radiation transfer equations, and electromagnetic field equations and gauge condition in cyclic way. <clears throat> so sometimes the black hole is formed or a black hole exists in, in the simulation. So we needed to implement a special technique to get a stable numerical simulation. <clears throat> and we also have to extract the gravitational wave signal from the simulation data. <clears throat> this is what we do, what we normally do in our simulation. <clears throat> I also stress uh, the, the uh, I also uh, the, the mentioned about the necessity of the big computational facilities. Uh, I'm involved in the Fugaku project in Japan, which is ranked as a number one right now. I also appreciate the, the computational facility provided by Max Planck Society. This is a great. So with these ingredients, new maker is a powerful to to predict or interpret gravitational wave events. So let's move on to the application. In this uh, part, I'm going to talk about the numerical. Uh, sorry, uh, in this uh, slide, I'm, I want to uh, mention about the GW190525. <laughs> LIGO and BAG reported the detection of this gravitational wave at uh, May 21st in 2019. The top panel showed the waveform modeling. On top of the gravitation, uh, on, on top of the on top of the observation data, and the bio didn't detect the gravitational waves. <coughs> so you can see that the couple of cycles, which are burst type of cycles, <coughs> and the bottom panel shows a spectrogram. The frequency as a function of time. You can see a bright spot, bright spot in uh, between forty and sixty hertz. And for, uh, by using the binary black hole module templates, they estimated the primary mass is uh, uh, 85, uh, 85 solar mass, and secondary, secondary mass is a 66 solar mass. <laughs> this is uh, uh, the mass uh, fascinated us because uh, we expect that black holes are mass gap between 50 and 120 uh, solar mass due to the pulsational pair instability or pair instability uh, explosion. Just after the, the report by uh, LIGO, the NITS and the Kaparo in AI, in AI Hanover did a reanalysis of this event by using uh, different priors and different waveform, uh, waveforms from the, those uh, or, uh, originally used. <laughs> and they reported that the uh, bimodal structure in uh, uh, probability uh, distribution of the mass function so they reported the primary component is the 168 solar mass and the, the secondary is the 16, 16 solar mass, which means that the black holes of a gas plant between 50 and 120 solar mass could be avoided. <clears throat> the other interesting point is that the maximum likely waveform suggests the post path uh, waveforms. Here is a zero waveform model. Here is a, the, uh, the burst type, uh, the burst type waveforms. After that, you, you can see that some signals, <coughs> they calculated the signal, signal to noise ratio and, and they found that signal to, signal to noise ratio is slightly higher than the waveforms without post pass waves, which means that uh, this signal could be the real. <coughs> and it, it's not easy to explain that this, this kind of like signal by uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I, I wonder if I can ask a question about that. So is the statement that they that what we see there is a is a waveform that is binary black hole that does show those oscillations afterwards? Right. Am I or is this a, just a smooth version of the data without a theory prior here? Okay. Sorry, sir. I, um, if I'm looking at the the curve that's drawn through the through the data is is a uh, is that the binary black hole merger template or is it 
uh, a smooth uh, version right. of the data. Uh, this same right is, I think, uh, the binary black hole uh, model template. Okay. So uh, from the analysis, we found uh, two interesting points. One is the uh, frequency in the spectral is between 40 and 60 hertz. And the other point is a post-burst waves might exist. <laughs> it's not conclusive, of course. So uh, based, uh, motivated by this fact, we, uh, we, we propose an alternative model for this event by, uh, by using the black hole mass of 50 solar mass surrounded by a massive solar mass of an order of 10 solar mass. <clears throat> Thinking about the uh, uh, black hole and torus system, the orbital time scale of the torus is about 10 times uh, the black hole solar mass. So if you assume the 50 solar mass, the orbital period of uh, the time scale becomes uh, 25 milliseconds, which corresponds to the 40 hertz. And the other point that uh, this system, black hole with a uh, massive torus system, could be subject to the, uh, the, the dynamical instability. With this as dynamical instability, the non axiometric st structure develops. So the system could be a good gravitational wave emitter. <clears throat> because of, uh, this instability is a dynamical one, the gravitational wave frequency should be associated with a dynamical, a dynamical time scale 40 hertz. The next question that this is. Sir, before you go on, could you comment on the statistical significance of the post merger waves? Uh, not so high. This one, right? This one, not so high. Sli slightly, they calculate the signature noise ratio. I don't have any number so difference between the signature noise ratio with and without post uh, burst, but uh, yeah. So the next question is, uh, is black hole of 50 solar mass surrounded by a massive torus of an order of 10 solar mass is uh, formation is possible? So still evolution calculation suggests that the flaps of very massive metal clusters, uh, the black hole formation, uh, the result in the black hole formation if the carbon oxygen core is greater than 125 solar mass. A new relativity simulation of gravitational collapse of very massive metal cross suggests that the outcome is a black hole of mass 130, uh, 130 solar mass, and the torus mass is a 220 uh, solar mass if the progenitor rotate. <clears throat> the temporal mass of the uh, black hole and the torus strongly depend on the rotational profile of the progenitor, which is not well understood. Uh, well understood. So we won't stick with uh, the precise number of the black hole solar mass and the torus. Anyway, so the 50 solar mass black hole surrounded by a massive torus of about four of 10 solar mass could be possible from the evolution point of view. The next question that such a system could be a, a emitter for the burst and post-burst gravitational waveforms. <clears throat> And Paparos and Kling uh, show that the black hole surrounded by the, the uh, disk uh, uh, is subject to the dynamical instability in 1984. But linear perturbation analysis uh, tells you that the emergence of the corrotational point in which the omega, the frequency, uh, the, angle, uh, the growth rate of the perturbation uh, quantity is equal to coincide with the uh, large omega uh, background uh, angular velocity profile. <clears throat> and if you think I will consider an incident way to the uh, rotational point, you can calculate the angular momentum flux for a reflected wave and transmitted wave. And you, you can also find that the, the former sign of the former is neg negative and sign of the later is positive, which means that the angular momentum is, tro uh, is transported outward through the at uh, a rotational point. And uh, this reflected wave is reflect at the inner uh, edge of the torus. So this process repeated again and again. And uh, finally, the, uh, the instability emerges. <clears throat> so detailed analysis of this instability suggests that the low M mode, where M is a uh, quantum number in a visual direction, is the most unstable mode. And angular momentum transports through the rotational point. 
after the, the, the emergence of the instability, the spiral arm develops, and then the burst type of the gravitational wave is emitted. And also quasi-periodic gravitational waves could be emitted after the saturation of the, the instability if the non-symmetric structure remains. <clears throat> Can I ask a quick question about the previous slide about the formation of the sort of black hole torus system? Mm -hmm. So it's probably very short lived. So, would we have seen the burst of gravitational waves from the formation of the black hole as well? Yeah, but uh, in the, the, at the timing of the formation of the black hole, the, this is a, a, a Asymmetric, almost an asymmetric structure system. So, the amplitude is much, much lower than the uh, burst type of the gravitational waves. Yes. So we're going to explore the, the, the possibility of the black hole with a, a very much torus as a so, as an engine of GW 19521. Uh, we fix a black hole mass at 50 solar mass, and we also vary the disk mass uh, and the compactness of the disk because we are aware that these uh, uh, these variables are key ingredient for the uh, for the gravitational wave emission from this system. <clears throat> So we perform the numerical relativity hydrodynamic simulations and the equilibrium configuration is given as an initial condition. And we implement the BSSN plus locally Z4C prescription for the Einstein solver. And we also employ the DD2 in which the low density region is extended to the Helmholtz instabilities. <clears throat> we intentionally turn off the neutrino radiation in this simulation because neutrino cooling makes the disk compact and this makes the, uh, the, the growth time of the, the instabilities and the gravitational wave morphology obscure. <clears throat> so just another general question. The Pepeloiza Pringle instability is very sensitive to other end of momentum transports. So if you do it in MHD, it, it, might, is, yes. it might go away. So yeah. what about gravitational instability in the torus? Uh, in, this, uh, in this system, uh, it's not subject to the gravitational instability. But uh, in this paper, we discussed about the MHD effect. And uh, uh, if the alpha, uh, the, the chakra signal parameter is not so large, uh, MHD instability does not affect uh, this instability. And, uh, uh, Recently, I talked with uh, Louis Milton in Havana Champagne in, uh, in uh, uh, Stuart Shapiro Group's member. And he actually, he did a perform of similar simulation with MHD effect, and he found the purpose, the emergence of the purpose. So let me show the, the, uh, the uh, uh, visualization. Is a density contour on the orbital plane, and for a representative model, which has a 50 solar mass black hole and 30 solar mass disk. <clears throat> and the black hole is here. Once I started the simulation, a new maker noise uh, causes uh, oscillation or pulsation of the torus. And then the M equal one instability up, appears after the, the couple of the orbital time scale, then spiral arms structure develops. And after that, the, the uh, uh, <coughs> quasi stationary state is achieved. <coughs> so to see more deeply, we perform a mode analysis for the density where CM is given by this. And delta UPM is a normalized amplitude for the model. This is a model analysis as a function of time for this representative model. And you can see that after the simulation, the, the new makeup, after you start the simulations, the new makeup noise excites the, the M, uh, irrespective of value of the M. But uh, after a couple of the orbital period of time, the M equal one starts to exponentially close. And it reaches to the point one in uh, normalized uh, the amplitude. And after the saturation, it settles down to the order of 10 to the minus two. <clears throat> and uh, we found that the gross time scale is the orbital time scale, which means that this instability is the dynamical instability. And we also find the M equal two and M equal three is decided by the nonlinear coupling of the M equal one mode. <clears throat> this is a typical evolution.
because the spiral arm structure develops and uh, the tensor, the gravitational burst type of the gravitational wave is emitted. This is a typical uh, waveform in this model. So you have a first, and after that, you, you can see that quasi periodic waves, which is associated, which is related to the non maximetric structure after the saturations. <clears throat> so we classify this waveform as a type one. And uh, next, we're going to explore the, the disk compactness dependence. And uh, this is a, a, the delta one and normalized amplitude evolution for a model with same uh, torus mass, but different compactness torus. From green to blue, from here to here, the compactness increases. <coughs> we found that the larger, larger, larger growth rate for more compact torus because small rotation radius for more compact torus model. We also found that the large peak value of delta one for more compact torus. This feature is reflected in, in the, is, uh, is imprinted in the gravitational wave forms. If the torus is, uh, torus compactness is not uh, large enough, we can, we can see that the type uh, waveform something like this, which is completely different from the type one. We call it the type two. <coughs> we also already uh, classify the type one to the subclass type one, W and type one S, depending on the amplitude of the, uh, the post uh, burst wave. <coughs> so here is a type one S, and here is type one W. The type one W is a relatively high amplitude appears in the post wave forms. <coughs> We also explore the disk mass dependence. This is again the, the normalized amplitude. In this model, the, uh, we, uh, uh, the older model has a approximately compactness, but from bottom to the, the panel, the disk mass increases. And again, I, uh, I found, uh, we found that the large growth rate for the more martial torus and the large peak value for delta one for the more martial torus. And these feature imprinted in the gravitational wave. From, uh, from less massive to the more massive case, the waveform type, wave type shift from type two, type one W and type one S. And this is a summary plot for the torus mass uh, in the torus mass and torus compactness uh, <coughs> uh, brand. And here is a type one S, here is a type one W, here is a type, a type two. And this shows a clear, uh, this approach shows that uh, the clear trend. For example, for a given mass ratio, if you go from here to here, the, uh, the type of wave, uh, type of gravitational wave shift from type 1s, type 1w, and type 1, uh, 2, as the compactness decreases, because as I show in the previous slide, the non, uh, normalized amplitude at the peak time is smaller for the less compact model. This implies that the gravitational torques at the peak time is not large enough to expel a large fraction of the matter in the high density region. That's why we get uh, the, the uh, waveform something like this. <clears throat> and so we have a question online yeah. from Jeremy. Hi, I'm very interesting. Um, are you sure you're seeing Papaloiza Pringle and not Friedman Schutz? I mean, uh, Papaloiza Pringle exists for a zero mass torus, given a certain radial extent and angular momentum profile. The fact that the growth rate increases with mass suggests that it might be gravitational wave reaction. Yeah. Um, and, and a related question is what angular momentum distribution did you put into the torus? Because is uh, PP is extremely sensitive to that. Exactly. So yeah, it is well known that the, the constant uh, specific angular momentum is a subject to the Papaloiza Pringle instability, but it's not a realistic profile. So we, in this model, we prepare the, the, the uh, specific angular momentum is proportional to the, the, the angular velocity. It has a power law function of the radius. <clears throat> it's more or less close to the Kepler. Okay, but what about the question about Friedman Schutz? I mean, could this instability be you know, which is which is an instability that arises because of the gravitational wave reaction, and therefore goes faster if you have a more massive torus. Yeah. Did did you actually for okay actually for more, more massive case though because is this uh, sorry.
for more massive case, I don't have a, any animation, but uh, anyway, so for more, more massive case, uh, the uh, from the back reaction that uh, uh, the, uh, due to the back reaction, the black hole starts moving, and uh, this effect becomes a uh, prominent for a massive torus case. So the back reaction is is large here. Did I answer your question? Uh, then we'll can discuss it later. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. So, for given the compactness uh, here, these directions uh, and uh, waveform type from shift to oneness, one W to two, uh, the mass ratio decreases. This is also because uh, the normalized amplitude at the peak time is smaller uh, as the mass ratio decreases. The physics is the same, so gravitational torques at the peak time is not large enough to expel a large fraction of the matter in high density regions. Then, so we also calculated the, the, our spectrum density on top of the LIGO sensitivity. We found that the signal to noise ratio is between 5 and 30 for a hypothetical distance of uh, 100 megaparsec. In these figures, we also find that uh, our spectral amplitude increases with the data frequency up to a certain frequency, then it quickly decreases. The later feature is very similar to the, the people found in the binary black hole merger simulation. Here is a, the power spectrum density of the binary black hole merger. Uh, at uh, at certain data frequency, the amplitude quickly decreases as the frequency increases. However, the former uh, uh, feature, the in power spectrum density increases with uh, the frequency is completely different from the binary black hole merger, which means that the low frequency spectra, uh, which means that the gravitational waves below the 30 hertz contain the information to distinguish the our scenario to the binary black hole scenario. However, the small uh, signal to noise ratio in uh, low, such a low uh, frequency range is still challenging. <clears throat> so we generated uh, the, a spectrogram for type 1W case, and here is a spectrum. We can a spectrogram, so we found that the bright spot at the 40 and 50 hertz <laughs> around the peak time. And uh, in the waveform, uh, the couple of the wave cycle along the peak time, uh, this feature uh, similar uh, uh, similar features with the GW1945-21. Uh, <clears throat> we also generate the uh, spectrogram for the type 1S and type 1T. For type 1S, the single cycle at the peak time in the waveform. For type 2, the broad bright spot appears in the spectrum. And uh, these, uh, these features may not compatible with uh, GW19 or So we conclude that uh, type one could be an alternative model for the, G for the binary black hole mergers or in GW19 or 521. <coughs> so the take home message is that the gravitational wave arrow cannot distinguish the source under the condition that the signal to noise ratio is not very high. So we may need an electromagnetic counterpart uh, to, to distinguish the, the, the scenarios. <laughs> and a long-term simulation of black hole torus system suggests 10 or 20% of the torus is rejected due to the viscous stream angular momentum transport. And the typical exact velocity is a point, uh, 0.05 or 0.1 or speed of light. The kinetic energy is attained to the 50 Hz given the uh, ejector mass and typical uh, ejector velocity. <clears throat> so, back envelope calculation that the electromagnetic counterpart could be observed for the, uh, the 100 megaparsec distance. But of course, the event rate of such a the gravitational collapse is, uh, has a big uncertainty. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to the se uh, second problem. Uh, this is a uh, I'm going to talk about our, our latest modeling of uh, black hole neutron star mergers. And the black hole neutron star merger is, could be a central engine of short hard gamma ray burst. Short uh, gamma ray burst is the most energetic explosive phenomenon in the universe. 
it consumes a 0 0.1, 0 0.01, or 0 0.1 percent of the less mass energy of the sun in the time scale of second, in particular for the short case. And this is a schematic picture for the gamma ray burst. At the central engine, the neutron stars or a black hole to drive the relativistic jet, and it propagates away. Then the uh, electromagnetic signals are emitted. <laughs> in GW7017, uh, the, uh, the short gamma ray burst was observed simultaneously. So this is uh, for, uh, the smoking gun of the merger hypothesis. So in this event, the consensus picture is that we observe this event from the off axis. But uh, this is uh, just one case. So in the future, uh, there, there will be uh, another, uh, uh, another event. <coughs> so we want to, to consider, we want to consider the possibility for the black hole neutron star mergers. <coughs> And LIGO Barbara Kagura collaboration reported the uh, uh, detection of binary black, black hole neutron star mergers. Here is a uh, uh, probability distribution for the primary, primary and the secondary component. And they detected the two binary, uh, two black hole neutron star mergers, GW20015 and GW20115. In this event, uh, there were no electromagnetic counterpart. <coughs> In this system, in black hole neutron star system, the tidal disruption is uh, important things. So let me explain the, the important gradient for the tidal disruption. You can easily derive the condition for the tidal disru disruption by equating the tidal force due to the black hole to the self-gravity of the neutron stars. The tidal radius, uh, if the tidal radius, which is characterized by uh, uh, the mass ratio, compactness of the neutron star, and the black hole mass is larger than the radius in a still circular orbit of the, uh, of the <clears throat> black hole, the tidal disruption happens. Because the uh, uh, radius of the in a still circular orbit depends on the black hole spin, the, there are key in, three key ingredients, spin of the black hole and mass ratio and compactness of the neutron star. Let me uh, give an intuitive explanation how the tidal disruption depends on this ingredient. Uh, it is known that the R is in a stable circular with the radius for non rotating black hole is uh, six times on the black hole mass. And for the extremely car case, it's going to be the, the one times of the uh, one time of the mass black hole, which means that the fast and the positive uh, spin of the black hole favors the tidal disruption. <clears throat> and the next thing is the mass ratio. If you increase mass ratio, you, you go to the point particle limit because the tidal force is uh, uh, the finite size of the effect of the neutron star. In such a limit, there is no tidal disruption. The final thing is the compactness of the neutron star. For if you think about the stiffification of state, which gives a small compactness, this is a, a pic, schematic picture of the radial profile of the density. It is um, more, more or less uh, uniform. And if you go, if you think about the, the soft equation of state, which gives a, a large compactness, a large compactness of the neutron star, the Profile uh, density profile radial profile of density is uh, is uh, centrally condensed. So in this case, the uniform density distribution is more subject to the tidal dis disruption. <clears throat> so if the tidal disruption happens, a part of the neutron star is ejected as a dynamical ejecta, and a part of the, the neutron star is uh, forms a massive torus. This is important for the electromagnetic counterpart in this event. <laughs> Before going to detail, let me briefly uh, uh, review about the, the electromagnetic emission in compact ion mergers. <clears throat> Suppose that the neutron rich matter is ejected from the system somehow. Uh, the seed nuclei captures the neutron, and because the time scale of the this capture process is shorter than the uh, beta time scale, the heavy elements are synthesized. This is a so-called rapid neutron capture process of our process uh, important. And the synthesized element plays an important role for the, the EMF electromagnetic emission. 
the first one is a heating source by a radioactive decay, and the other one is a, it's going to be the opacity source if the lanthanoid element is produced. <coughs> the opacity is 10 square centimeter per gram for a lanthanoid element, and this opacity is greater, 100 times greater than the opacity for the iron element because the energy excitation level is uh, much, much greater than the uh, iron elements. <coughs> and uh, uh, in the initial phase, uh, the ejector is optically six, and uh, it expands with a mildly relativistic speed. And at some point, the diffusion time scale of the photon is uh, shorter than the dynamical time scale, then the uh, ejector shine, <laughs> plugging the typical number of the uh, uh, three typical parameter for the opacity and ejector, uh, mass and the velocity of the ejector, you can roughly estimate the peak time and the peak luminosity, and this is the so-called kilonova or macronova. Anyway, the, cup, uh, the opacity and the ejector mass and velocity of the ejector is an important parameter, important parameter in this electromagnetic emission system. <clears throat> So let me explain the, okay, the opacity is important. So let me explain the relation between the, uh, the, the opacity and the electron fraction, we call, sometimes call it YE, which is uh, the ratio of the number of electron to number uh, ion. <clears throat> and the left hand side here show that the mass uh, fraction as a function of time, uh, as a function, sorry, atomic number, uh, for assuming that the electron fraction of Ejector in binary neutron star mergers. And the right hand side figure is uh, show that opacity as a function of wavelengths. <laughs> and you can see that if the electron fraction is greater than 0.25, the negligible or small amount of the lantern is produced, which result in the low opacity in blue case. On the other hand, if the electron fraction is smaller than 0.25, uh, the uh, uh, significant amount of the lantern is produced, which result in the high opacity in infrared and plasma. And the neutral reaction determines the electron fraction of the ejector. That's why the, uh, the neutral radiation transfer is important. <clears throat> So let me consider about uh, uh, the equivalent value of the electron fraction. <coughs> Thinking about the electron capture balances with uh, positron capture, you can estimate the equivalent value of the electron fraction. And you can also estimate the equilibration time scale in which the chemical equilibrium is achieved. <coughs> if the equilibration time scale is shorter than that, expansion time scale or dynamical time scale of the post merger ejector, then the equilibrium is achieved. Here is a, a, the plot for, uh, for this analysis. The black contour shows the equilibrium value of the electron fraction, and the background color shows the equilibration time in the log scale. <laughs> On top of that, uh, I show that the electron fraction of the fluid element in the simulation you can see that uh, in the initial phase, uh, the electron fraction, uh, the equi chemical equilibrium is achieved, and the electron fraction settles down to the uh, equi equilibrium value of the electron fraction, uh, in particular for the high density and uh, the high temperature issue, because the equilibration time is, uh, is uh, shorter than the expansion time scale. So once the, the post merger object evolves at the density and the temperature goes down, then the, at some point, the expansion time scale or dynamical time scale is shorter than the equilibration time scale. Then the weak, uh, weak interaction process freezes out, which determines the electron collection of the object. So with this background, we're gonna, we, uh, we perform a new maker reality, Newton radiation, magnetohydrodynamic simulation of black hole neutron star merger. As I explained in the previous slide, neutral radiation transfer is necessary to predict the electron fraction of the ejector, and magnetohydrodynamics is necessary to follow the massive torus evolution, in particular the angular momentum transport. I'm gonna explain later on. And a merger simulation is also necessary to build a self-consistent model of the massive torus formation. So we performed an extremely long-term simulation uh, up to two seconds in physical time. 
And then, of course, we select the model which subject uh, which is subject to the tidal description. Okay, let me show the visualization. Here is a uh, uh, <coughs> visualization on a meridian plan. Sorry, uh, quick question. Could you explain a little more about the neutrino radiation transfer? Is it uh, in, energy, in energy dependent? Or? So, in, okay, we employ that very uh, crude approximation, uh, the gray approximation and M1 scheme. But uh, the, uh, the source time is evaluated by uh, with a leakage scheme. <clears throat> yeah. We need a more sophisticated neutrino radiation transfer. Yeah. I, so, okay, this is a visualization. So, uh, for a medial plan, so black, black hole always uh, sit uh, at the center from top left to the bottom uh, right. The density is electron fractions, magnetic field strengths, uh, temperatures, and uh, magnetization parameters, entropy per baryon, and the Bernoulli criterion and the geodesic, geodesic criterion. So uh, the neutron size tidal is disrupted and a part of the neutron size ejected as a dynamic ejector, here is a dynamic ejector, and massive torus is formed in this model. So inside a massive uh, accretion, massive torus, uh, the magnetic rotational instability and magnetic winding are amplified and field. And then so the torus gradually expands due to the angular momentum transport. <coughs> I'm, I'm gonna explain the detail later on. And the polar region is evacuated and the magnetosphere is formed. And at some point, uh, the magnetically powered jet is a jet, no, I wouldn't say jet, but uh, uh, this is an outflow, magnetic power outflow is branched from the, from the, the vicinity of the black hole. <coughs> And uh, the torus expands gradually due to the angular momentum. And the opening and angle of the panel region, per, the, in the initial phase, it's really small. But uh, due to the expansion of the angular uh, uh, massive torus, the opening angle of the panel regions increases as well. Then, uh, yeah, and now we found that the outflow from to the polar directions. So let me explain what causes the, the angular momentum transport. <coughs> the, it is so-called the magnetorotational instabilities uh, causes uh, the, the angular momentum transport. The, the condition for this instability is quite simple, the negative gradient of the angular velocities. So let me show an intuitive explanation for the magnetorotational instability. If you think about the two fluid elements, which are shown in blue circle in this system, with, and they are connected by magnetic field line, they orbit around the central object. <coughs> because of the, this condition, the inner fluid elements rotate faster than the outer uh, fluid element. And then the inner fluid element is decelerated because the magnetic field line plays some spring uh, as, as a spring. As a spring. <clears throat> On the other hand, the outer fluid element is accelerated. <clears throat> In other words, the inner uh, fluid elements lose angular momentum, and the outer fluid elements uh, get uh, the, the angular momentum. <clears throat> because the, the centrifugal force should balance it with the gravity of the central uh, object, and this inner fluid element. Uh, shift to the inner radius. On the other hand, the outer fluid element shift to the, the outer radius. And this, uh, this is a negative uh, feedback process. And uh, this uh, process repeated again and again. And finally, the MRI produces a turbulence. <coughs> the MRI-driven turbulence produces an effective viscosity. And this effective viscosity drives angular momentum transport. And it also provides a viscous heating. <coughs> So we have to check that this MRI works in oscillation. To see it, we generated the, uh, the space-time diagram for the azimuthal component of the magnetic field. First, we prepared a sphere uh, uh, with a certain radius, and we project the, the, the magnetic field on top of the sphere. <coughs> here is a aura, here is an orbital plan, and you can see that the for a uh, negative and positive sign of the magnetic field, uh, magnetic field appears repeatedly. And uh, due to the magnetic buoyancy, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, due to the magnetic buoyancy, it towers to the high latitude regions. And then, so the 
uh, the sign of the on field uh, flips, and this is um, evidence of the MRI diamond works in our simulation. So uh, we also measure the effective time viscosity, which is the about 0.01 in the upper parameter. So with this, the torus expands due to the angular momentum transport. The left-hand side figure show that the neutrino luminosity as a function of time, here is a log, log plot. In the initial phase, let's say the time scale of order 100 milliseconds, a part of the viscous heating is consumed by the neutrino emission. Then the temperature gradually decreases due to the torus expansion. And at some point, uh, the neutrino emission becomes efficient because the temperature is, is, is low. <laughs> then all the viscous heating is used for the torus expansion. Then the part of the, uh, the torus is ejected as a post martial This is uh, the picture, what we, uh, picture we have in mind. And the left-hand side figure show that the gravitational unbounded baryon, baryonic mass as a function of time. In this model, the first the dynamical ejector appears at around 10 milliseconds, and then the post merger ejector appears, let's say, 300 or 200 milliseconds. <clears throat> and because the temperature is low, now the uh, weak interaction freezes out. The electron fluxion at this moment is an electron fluxion of the ejector. This is an important information. To see it more, more uh, quantitatively, I maybe generated the uh, electron fluxion distribution for the gravitational unbounded material. You, you can see the two distinct peaks. One is a low electron fluxion, which comes from the dynamic energy, because the neutron star is a neutron star. <laughs> neutron is composed of neutrons, so electron fluxion should be low. And the other component is a high electron fluxion peaking around 0.25 and uh, between 0.25 and 0.35. This is a post merger ejector. <clears throat> Although the nuclear synthesis calculations and the light curve calculation are ongoing, we expect that the first component is, sorry, first component is. Uh, uh, it's bright, uh, it is. Uh, First component uh, produces a lead emission in near infrared fan, and uh, later component uh, produces a blue emission in optical emission. <laughs> Finally, so I want to uh, I want to show you that the, the magnetically tower outflow. <clears throat> so in this simulation, I show that densities and the magnetic field lines. And as I explained a couple of times, the, after the formation of the massive accretion torus, the MRI works on inside the accretion torus, and uh, the torus gradually expands, and a polar region is evacuated because of the four backs of the matter here. Then at some point, uh, the uh, magnetic tower outflow is branched from the system, something like this. <laughs> but the torus keeps increasing. <clears throat> So we uh, uh, observe the magnetic tower jet build up the magnetosphere, and then so the uh, isotropic pointing luminosity suddenly uh, steeply increases up to the 10 to 50 or 10 to 51 elks per second. And we measure the jet or you know, outflow opening angle, and it is uh, about 10 degrees. So the isotropic equilibrium luminosity and the jet opening angle are roughly consistent with the observed value of the, final, uh, of the short gamma ray burst. <clears throat> what is uh, interesting in our model is that the, the, uh, the typical duration of short gamma ray burst could be explained. This figure shows that the pointing flux distribution on the sphere with a certain radius at uh, selected slices. In the initial phase, because uh, the tunnel region is uh, the opening angle tunnel region is small, let's say 10 degree or something like that, you have a very intense pointing flux distribution. But uh, with the expansion of the torus, this tunnel region becomes something like this which means that the pointing flux decreases while the luminosity keeps constant. <laughs> so after the two seconds, the pointing flux becomes, uh, becomes low. 
which means that the time scale of the one or two second in the short primary bus could be or may be associated with the neutrino cooling time scale and the uh, angular, uh, angular momentum time scale. <clears throat> okay, then let me summarize my talk. So in gravitational wave astronomy era, numerical relativity modeling is uh, important to predict or interpret the gravitational wave events. Uh, as an example, we demonstrate a black hole massive torus system could be the origin of GW 1921. This is a, a demonstration for the interpretation of the gravitational wave events. And we realize the electromagnetic counterpart of observation is necessary to distinguish the, the, the two scenarios. <clears throat> As a second part, to, pre to predict the gravitational wave event, a black hole neutron will be demonstrate a black hole neutron star merger could drive a short camera first. <clears throat> of course, this is not conclusive because you know we only perform the simulation in a very limited region of parameter space. And so we need a more sophisticated modeling uh, uh, to mitigate the uh, mitigate, uh, systematic error. And we can also play the same game for uh, binary neutron star mergers. In this, in lunchtime, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the latest uh, simulation, latest result of binary neutron star mergers. That's all. Time for questions. I'll alternate between the audience and on Zoom. Uh, if there's any questions. Uh, how well resolved is the MRI? Uh -huh. So we check the quality factor. Uh, the plus is growing more divided by the width resolution. It's greater than the uh, twenty or something. Yeah. It seems like uh, in your uh, first massive black hole and torus system. To have this kind of peak and the first mode, it seems like it has to grow from some smooth porous. Mm -hmm. Is this kind of the realistic huh. setup? Or? I wouldn't say this is a realistic. So to do that, so we need a self consistent simulation for a gravitational flux of a massive, massive stars, but the axisymmetric uh, gravitational flux, uh, axisymmetric simulation of the gravitational flux of very massive uh, metal clusters suggest it, this kind of torus formation. When the when torus are formed, it might have this kind of the smooth. Yeah. Of course, uh, we need uh, uh, the assume for uh, entropy distribution or something like that. This is not consistent with uh, uh, the crop simulation. So we plan to do it in, in the future. Or three, but uh, computational cost is very expensive. Um, I wonder what set your jet luminosity in terms of you get something like kind of a 50 ergs per second. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you always get so consistently? Because that's a small fraction of the total luminosity of the system. Yeah, exactly. So, so we yeah. only perform the simulation for the two binary configuration. So I, I wouldn't say this is a universal number, but uh, at least uh, in this case, massive torus formation case, uh, I, we, we get uh, this number. But of course, it depends on the, the, the spin of the black hole and uh, the equation of set, or state of the neutron star. In this system, because we are interested in a system which is subject to the tidal disruption, we assume the black hole spin is a 0.75 in non-dimensional spin. So what were the mass ratios of this? Mass ratio is Q equal four and uh, Q equals six or something. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that in your magnetic field values, they went up to 10 to the 15 Gauss in the, in the Newton star. Yes, that, that uh, um, so um, how realistic is it? Where, where are these values? Yeah, this, so, yeah, in this simulation, yeah, of course, yeah, we assume the ultra strong magnetic field strengths to resolve the MRI. Uh, so, uh, specifically speaking, uh, the, uh, we assume that 10 to 16 Gauss is not realistic value. But uh, we slightly change uh, this uh, uh, magnetic field strength, and the result doesn't uh, depend on the assumed. Uh, the, does it noticeably, if it were the same, that value, would anything happen to it quantum mechanically on those time scales, or is it too short of a time scale for it to start decaying into electron quantum? I think lambda quantization could be important, but uh, in our configuration, the, the magnetic field 
is buried inside a neutron star in a very dense region. In such a high density region, the lambda contact neutron effect is not important. And the other point is that due to the spiral formation and the spiral shock waves that heat, 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 heat uh, material, so in this high uh, temperature region, the quantum uh, the mechanics, uh, mechanic effect doesn't uh, play out. In later phase, I don't know. Um, okay, we have time for one more question. Is there any any questions online? Okay, we've already had some questions, so I'll, I'll go on to the last question. Can, can you give some details on this uh, horizon finder and why it's important for numerical stability? This one, a horizon finder is a... Uh, mm, Okay, this is our uh, private, <laughs> our group private web code. Horizon Finder is developed by the Masaru Shibata almost uh, 20 years ago, something like that. But uh, anyway, the, uh, sorry, what's the program? So what's the version of Horizon Finder? Yeah, why is it important for numerical stability to use such a Horizon Finder? Ah, uh, because you know, okay. This is a technical reason and not a physical reason, but inside a black hole, you know, the temperatures and the density become so high, it's beyond the uh, range of the tabulated equation state. So we need a uh, prescription to exercise for a fluid element inside a horizon. So that's why we need a horizon finder. Did I ask, answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Well, um, let's thank Kanta again for a really great talk. 